I thank God that somehow I always have the privilege to preach during ES, during the National Day weekend. So a National Day message, I believe, needs a very careful thought through, especially we know national affairs and world affairs are very much interconnected nowadays. Now we know we have an unprecedented year. We had the COVID-19 and we had an election. And I believe most of you know the big world issues that are happening now, trade war, technological war, and America just moved to ban TikTok and WeChat a few days ago. So end of the year, we will have the American presidential election, which is something very much watch, okay? Um, so I believe Christians, we who are called to pray for our country and for the world, we should not be just engrossed in bread and butter issues, uh, but we also should merely understand national and world affairs as what some common, common folks understood. It's uh, not coffee shop talks, okay? Now we have to know, as Christians, wherever that is happening in this country or in this world, there is the reality of spiritual operation behind everything that happened. So when I say spiritual operation, I meant the unseen forces. And when we say unseen forces, we know first of all the unseen satanic forces, but also God is involved. So God, in his timing, in his way, is bringing about judgment and also salvation at the same time. So he has allowed something, good or bad, to happen to exercise both judgment and salvation, and in the meantime, to do a thorough sifting of his church. Now, if you read the Bible, you know the church has to be sifted. And so, true and false believers at the end, will be clearly differentiated. So when unsettling sentiments become widespread, true believers, the so-called chosen ones, will be drawn back to his church, brought to the right knowledge of God, while the false believers will gradually leave the church, they will develop their own beliefs or develop their way of survival. But as we know, the work of the Antichrist will be relentless against the church of God. And so, in the words of the Apostle Paul, we know those who want to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. It will be increasingly hard for us, increasingly hard for us to gather, to evangelize, or to practice our faith freely, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceived and being deceived. They will have a way to manufacture Christianity so as to draw more people to them. Um, but they are operating by the insinuation of the dark forces. Now, it not only happens now, but it has been happening throughout ages, century. And now you see God has allowed the chaos, the mess, the polarization, the pandemic, the stopping of programs in the church. And what is God doing? It's for us Christians to take a hard look at ourselves and ask, what kind of Christianity has God actually called us to? And how do we prepare ourselves to face this whole situation as the remnant of God? We have only one intention, my brethren, and that is to hold on to the pure faith given by the gospel and spread that faith. Um, but we know the world and its machineries will come against us. We don't want to be misinformed. What is bound to happen will happen. So it's very important that as we move towards the last days, we must know how to pray for the leaders. In fact, the underlying message for today's sermon is to encourage us to pray for our leaders and to know how to do so. 
All right? So when we say pray for leaders, basically there are two kinds of leaders. The first kind, as what everyone knows, the world looks to them. They are the world political leaders. They are at the forefront making all the decisions, formulating all the policies, enforcing the laws of the country. The world recognize such leaders. They are given an office which impact the country and the world at large. But we have to pray for them, and especially Christian political leaders, so to speak. So today we're going to talk a lot about them, okay? How to pray for the Christian political leaders and the dilemma they are in now, all right? And then the next kind of leader, I think which is very subtle, the world doesn't look to them, but we know God has appointed them to have a real and enveloping influence over every leadership in this world. And this is the church leaders. They are the spiritual leaders whom many of the worldly people do not recognize. But he is the leader whose prayer God listens to. And if they are clear about the will of God, if they preach the will of God and pray in accordance to it, now you will see how God answers their prayer and because of their prayer, impact the decision, the policies of the lawmakers. Okay, And that's why you see this in the, the book of the kings. Every time God appoints the king of Israel, God also appoints the prophets and the priests to pray for the king, which is the political leader, so to speak. So I want all of you to understand how to pray for these two kinds of leaders. So two weeks ago, I've spoken about the powers of the church. I talked about what the leadership of the church is about. We have to be clear about the gospel. And we believe in a communion of saints with our eyes set upon world evangelization, right? I've spoken about that. So today, um, I'm going to talk more about political leaders. Now, how do we actually pray for them? So can we turn to the book of Exodus? Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. Now when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. Now, we know that Moses is actually the real spiritual leader over Israel, while Aaron now is managing over Israel, and especially a people who just came out from where? From circular Egypt. And we know a circular people, they live by sight, not by faith. They live by what their heart feels like, not by the laws of God. So while Moses gone into the mountains, a circular people is struck with fear and insecurity. And they ask Aaron for something that can be seen. Gods or images that can be seen to be with us to be seen guiding us so that our hearts will feel more safe and secure. Now that's what the world always wanted. And Aaron know what the people wanted. They want something they have seen before in Egypt, an image of a calf, which represents an Egyptian god. So what happened now? Aaron, probably in fear and helplessly answered them, Take off the gold and earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Now this human made, human manufactured. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. You saw that? A golden calf that represents security and prosperity. Verse 5, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, 
Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. And the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Now, as in, now these are ritual, you know, but who are they doing this to? And afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in reverie. Uh, as it is, with idol worshipping, the hearts of the people turned loose. The sinful nature didn't want to feel just secure and prosperous. They want to feel free and hearty. They want to indulge. They don't want any control. They want reverie. Okay? So as with all leadership, it always faces the pressure of the needs and wants of the people. And leaders who fear losing their position will always give in. So from here, I will give you a National Day message. Well, at the same time, if I could instill some spiritual lessons for all of us. Okay, we have gone through the national election, am I right? And how many of you don't know what's going on? You didn't read anything about the election, you know nuts about it? Raise up your hand. Okay, so I presume all of you have read the papers, we, you have gone through the social medias, you know what are the issues involved. So I presume we have heard enough from both sides of the camp, the ruling party and the opposition party about how the country should run and what are the issues involved. So put together, I would say there are three hard nuts to crack, in my opinion, okay? Now, these three hard nuts will be a constant pressure to the national leaders. So if you want to pray for them, we need to know what is it, okay? So to put it simply, three things. Number one, that is the diversity. Number two, economy. And what is the last one? Fear, all right? So that sums up the whole message. So first, let's talk about diversity. It's getting a little blurred, no? We cannot see. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, let's talk about diversity. Now, I, I personally believe that it's pretty simplistic to say, oh, young generations, they are more concerned only about social issues like social injustice, freedom of speech, while older generation, they care more about the bread and butter, the jobs and salary and all. I think it's pretty simplistic to say that now because everyone wants to put a reason behind a result. But the fact is, everyone has different needs or different issues they are convicted about, right? So I would say diversity is inevitable. But I would say diversity is not a sin, all right? Every one of us, we see things from different angles. We are convicted about different things. So I would say Diversity is a gift that God has given the human race so that all of us can be passionate and interested about different things, different people. And this could be a result of our background, our personality, or our inclination. Say, for instance, if you are from a poor family background, I presume when you grow up, you will be more passionate about helping the underprivileged people, am I right? And say if you're a parent whom you realize your child didn't realize his full potential in school, you will have a lot of things to say about the education system. Am I right to say that? So even in a church, there is diversity and there should be. And personally, I believe it's a beautiful thing. If someone in the church come and tell me, hey, pastor, I, I think you have given a lot of your attention to parents in the church, but you know, I'm a singer, I need some answers, or pastor, I feel you're always talking to the young people, but I need an, some attention as an elderly, I think good, okay? I'm not going to fire you, okay? I think it's a good thing that if you can come to me and tell me your concerns so that I could think more holistically, you should be. So diversity is a gift that God has given us. It makes the human race beautiful and complete. But sin has made diversity 
divisive. It caused polarization. It caused ideological conflicts, whether it's in the nation or in the church. And people start fighting with one another. They try to convince each other that they are right. They try to claim superiority about their views. And they say, your views is wrong. My views is right. I'm more legitimate. You know, that kind of thing. And when that happens, divisions are not dealt with. And then, listen, you will have a generation of people rising up, advocating their notion of fairness and unity. So these people talk about, let's be fair, let's be united, okay? We want to see every view accepted, everyone can be right, everyone have a voice. With that, let's put aside what is objective truth, never mind about the ultimate reality, never mind about what the Bible says, so the society in that sense becomes more and more liberal with everyone's needs and voices and rights being deemed legitimate. Now listen carefully. When that happens, for a start, people think that is the right thing and the right way to achieve unity. But they're far from right. Because when everyone is right, then who is wrong? You know what I'm trying to say? So what I'm trying to say now is in pursuit of unity, people put away the objective truth. Doesn't matter whether God exists or not. Doesn't matter what the Bible says is right or not. Eventually, there will be more disunity. You get that, what I'm saying here? So without the objective truth, without the highest authority of truth, which we know is the Bible, the world will just become increasingly divisive. And that is one big problem the circular government cannot resolve. And evidently, the world which doesn't turn to God will ultimately go down to the path of liberalism. They will accept everything, whether you are heterosexual, you are LGBT, you are pro-family, pro-life, pro-stem cells, wherever. Just take in, okay? You, you are right, in a, in a sense, you know? Just accept everyone. So anyone who claims that they are more right will be deemed offensive to the other camp. You get what I mean? So do you think unity can be achieved that way? So that kind of unity is what I call a godless unity or a liberal unity, a, a unity that downplay biblical truth. So no need to talk about what principle. You have your own principle. You made up your own principle, whether it's money principle, marital principle, sex principle, education principle. No, as long as it works, it will be fine, okay? So you have a glimpse of this kind of unity in the scripture we've just read. The people of Israel just came out from Egypt and they could no longer see Moses. So they come together for unity and they want to raise up a leader who could give them what they want. And so that is what I meant by you have to pray for our Christian political leaders, even as they serve a circular nation, that they will be firm in their guiding principle which they have gotten from the Bible. You saw the office holders during their swearing in, you know, they hold the Bibles. Quite a number of them did that. But it's really not about holding the Bible at that moment, you know, it's really abiding, adhering to the truth principle that is being taught in the Bible. So if the church wants to help the Christian political leaders, the church has to teach the right gospel, the right message, to give the right spirit of Christianity. If spiritual leaders in the church starts to teach gospel in a way like the prosperity gospel, the hyper-grace message, the mystical Christianity, the apostolic movement, that kind of gospel, it doesn't help. It only gives 
the world a false sense of Christianity. So you see, Christian political leaders and church leaders must be together. And they are intertwined, interlinked. Who is going to teach the Christian political leaders? Who is going to pray for them and give them the, the right guidance at the right time? That is the church leaders, spiritual leaders. You get what I mean? So, if everyone loses their footings, that's it. So the issue of diversity is a bigger issue that we have to think of. Okay, if we are just talking about young people and old people, those working and not working, it's not so simple. You know, it got to do with the liberalism ideology, the liberalism movement that is impacting, influencing the church and the church pulpit and the young people and the next generation. And so that when you see come to a point when the circular leaders, they can't do anything, they have to win votes, they will give in to whatever you want. You will see many, many errands <laughs> rising up at the end when there are no church leaders praying for them and advising them. You get what I mean? So you got a whole picture? Now that's number one, diversity, okay? Number two, okay, which is, I'm going to spend a lot of time on this because uh, this is what most people are concerned about. That is the economy, okay, economy. Now I think creating a robust economy, providing good and stable jobs for the people have been one of the hallmarks of the Singapore government. Amen to that? Now I'm not saying bread and butter issue is not important. I'm not saying peace and prosperity is not important. In fact, material provision and well-being has always been a legitimate need for men. But the question to ask is, how much is enough? If you talk about provision, how much provision? And when it comes to a point where having more equals poorer, because why the human heart grows to be discontented with what it has. It always wants more. And it becomes more unsatisfied. And with so much more it has, it has become spiritually poorer. It doesn't know what is prudency. It doesn't know what is the joy of giving more. All it knows is accumulating more. And the more it has, the more it worries that one day it, they will not have. So you see what the Bible says in James. James chapter 5. It says, you rich people weep and wail because of the misery that's coming upon you soon. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. You have trusted in riches and you have built up your wealth at the expense of the poor. There's no equality in wealth. And then you remember what God said to the rich fool? You fool, you who have planned so much, accumulated so much, so that you can have a comfortable life tonight. Your soul will be demanded from you and who are going to take over from you what you have? You get what I mean? Now, we, we read all these verses, but I can tell you that these verses are very much less being read nowadays. Now, all the verses we usually heard of in churches is God favoring us and reaching us, multiplying our wealth beyond measures. Now, I'm not saying God will not bless us materially, but the Bible always talk about the richness of the heart, the richness of giving, the richness of tithing, the richness of not putting your trust in riches. It's not the riches where you've seen in this affluent society where people get into a rat race to get a better job so they get paid better, they can drive better cars, buy a bigger house, and then come to a a point, you know, with just a few thousand dollars salary, they want to buy a condominium. Now, in fact, personally, I hope our national leaders will realize that we are a nation that cannot keep creating material dreams for our people. Come to a point, we have to realize that being better off materially doesn't mean happiness. In fact, it will make a new generation more discontented. It will erode our values and everyone will just wish to get rich quickly and they will not understand the dignity of working hard, gain specialization and living in contentment. I don't know whether you get me. Now, let me say something very 
economics here. Okay, you don't have to know economics. I mean, I study economics in uni, but you don't have to know economics to understand this, okay? Now, personally, I feel that one of the killer in our economic policy is the relentless quest for higher productivity. Now, how many of you do doesn't know what is higher productivity? In simple terms, meaning getting one worker to produce more, to deliver more. Why is the need for that? Have you all asked? So teachers, you've got to work a lot of harder, right, nowadays? Uh, you have to manage a lot, whole lot of things, not just your curriculum, not just your academic aspect, everything else, higher productivity. Why, why there is a quest for higher productivity? Relentless quest. Because all of us need higher salary to sustain our increased spending. Okay? And so, you ask, is it the cost of living going up? Yes, to a certain extent. But it could also be our standard of living is going up. The kind of standard of living that we are pursuing, the material pursuit, as I've just said. The other day, Deacon John was telling me, you know, his friends, who's Deacon John, okay? Yeah, back, okay? He says, telling me his friends in 30 plus, you know, owning a condominium is one big thing in their acquire list, to acquire list, do you know what I mean? In 30 plus, 40s, before 40s, get a condominium. Now, when you want to do that, you need very high salary. You buy a $1 million, $1.2 million condominium, now you ask yourself how much you're going to pay a month. And so you want to have that kind of salary. Now, tell you, salary has increased, but in real sense, it has not. During my time when, when an engineer graduate, he draws 2,500. And tell you how much you draw you know, when you graduate, you know. <laughs> now I can tell you now people draw about 3,500 newly grad engineer, okay? And, and you know, because of market forces, for you to draw that kind of salary, you need to work much harder and more productively. So it used to be 10 person will do 10 person's job. Now five persons have to do 10 person's job. And whether you are an engineer or an accountant, or if you are cleaner, for you to have a couple of hundred dollars increase in salary, you got to learn how to use a cleaning machine so that you can clean more areas in the same amount of time. And you heard all this thing about minimum wage and progressive wage. I'm not going to go into that, but you, you should know if you read the papers and all. Now, and that's why there is this going for training and retraining. I am not against training. I am for training. I am not against raising productivity because I know the Bible teaches against laziness. We should not be lazy. We should strive, work hard to realize our potential. But if, if we people harbor a material dream which is unrealistic, now you ask yourself, for you to keep drawing that high amount of salary to go up in position, you can spend more time, you got to produce more, relentless quest for higher productivity, what will happen to your family life? It will take away your happiness, it take away your family time, take away your creativity, and take away your values. Raising productivity is right, but there is only so much a human being can do. And if you look at the Japanese, they are very productive. But you don't want to inherit their mental condition. You get what I'm trying to say? Now, I just uh, spoke to a teacher uh, for the past week. Uh, he became, now I know him very well. Uh, this brother, he became a teacher because he has a passion to teach. He was previously an engineer. And uh, he went into teaching because of passion, and he knows to teach well and teach with integrity, he has to arouse the curiosity of a student by which the creativity will come. You get what I mean? 
And to do that, he has to teach not only what is in the textbook, but also out of the textbook. Say, for instance, if he teaches electronics, he not only have to just teach, uh, he has to teach how a circuit really works. No, he was telling me how a circuit really works. Other, rather than just telling them, okay, just apply formula and score A's. You get what I'm trying to say? So, he said, our system of education doesn't encourage him to do so. Why? Two reasons. First, that kind of teaching culture is not there. Because every other teacher, even his supervisor, will tell him to teach only what is needful for passing the exams. And second, the education system will tell him the education system will give him a lot, a lot more things and curriculum to, to cover. So that now he realized he can only go off school at two plus, three plus, my daughter come back every day at five, not CCA, okay? Uh, or four plus or five. Now, our days is, Adrian, how, what time do you off school? My time is 12.30 or one o'clock the latest. Now you talk about child come back at three plus four and homework plus all the tuition and all. Where, where could he get any creativity? He would just want to finish everything so that he can get to his handphone and do what he wants and all. You, you get what I mean? So the thing is, actually this brother told me something that really impressed upon my heart. He said, we have a very, very good education values that is left down by our education predecessors. It talks about character building, ethics, the values of learning, and how to live together in a community. And so he being a form teacher, he knows. Okay, we have a lot of teachers here, okay? I'm saying, that's why I'm saying this example, okay? Okay, now he being a form teacher, he knows that these are things written down on paper. But with the spirit to bring it out, he got to teach it. During when? During CCE lesson. And he knows jolly well that a lot of teachers can't be bothered with CCE lesson because the students also can't be bothered. So the teachers will just read from the slides, okay? So for him, he tried to do something different and then try to educate them, you know, and I mean, to his best ability, you know, but he know they can't be bothered. And the thing is, I told him, you know, if you grade CCE, you will see everyone get serious with it. But how do they get serious? They will get serious about how to get A's for that subject without getting the spirit of it. You get what I'm trying to say? So this I'm saying, okay, why is this happening? Because we are still, despite everything put down on the paper, we are still very much an economy, capital, and finance-driven nation. When that is our ultimate objective, there is not much room for maneuvering. Now, and you see, talking about education, okay, I'm, I am very concerned about education as a pastor. You know why? Because I have read the reformers. I know how concerned they are about schools, about education, and I tell you, in, in education, let me tell you, the first and foremost thing in education is not the knowledge per se, but rather, what is the ultimate purpose of that subject matter? You get what I'm saying? It's not the knowledge. It's not the knowledge of physics or bio. It's not the knowledge, but what is the purpose of it? In philosophy, we call it teleology. Which have you studied that in uh, seminary? In teleology, T-E-L-E-O-L-O-G-Y. Now, what is teleology? It comes from the Greek word telos. The telos means the finer causality, the finer purpose, the chief end. You get what I mean? So, listen. So, before you study physics, you ask, what is the goal of physics? Before you study biology, what is the purpose of biology? You have to get that right first before you go into wow, biology, physics, you know, the formula, everything else. You, you get what I mean? 
So that is value logic. Now, in education, in an economy-driven country, we don't care what is teleology. We just know what works, what delivers wealth, what can create job. But you see, when you study bio, and you don't study teleology, the reformers, they are most concerned about teleology, the final goal, final purpose first. You see, when in the bio, you don't study teleology, you don't care what's the goal or the purpose and all, what comes out is you will come to a point where people, where the country can find you for abusing a dog or put you in jail for abusing a cat but do nothing to you for aborting a human embryo. You, got, you get what I'm trying to say? Because you don't know what is the purpose of biology. It's life. That's what the Bible says. It's life that must live. You get what I mean? When you study economics, is it, is it to achieve wealth, good wealth distribution, wealth equality, or is it to create more wealth, bring in investment, generate more wealth? Now, the thing is, if you come to a point, you don't study the chief end, the theology of economics. All you know is how to let the economy make money and roll, 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 and the money comes in, investment comes. Now, you will come to a point for the sake of money, you will open casino. You know what I mean? And uh, you will bend to the will of stronger nations, wealthy investors. You know what I mean? I'm trying to say. Now, now, I purposely reserve this message till now so that I don't influence any one of you for the election, okay? But the thing is, as Christians, we must not shun from society issues. I've been thinking through all these things, and I really give thanks for my government. But there are certain things that we need to be wise, informed, and discerning. Because you are the people who have the ultimate truth of God, the Bible. And with the Bible, you make good discernment, and you know how to pray for our Christian leaders to stand their ground, and in certain things, what should their goals and direction be? In policy making, sometimes it's not about how good, how good that policy, it's just a little bit of difference, but the direction of that policy. You got, I'm trying to say? Now you see, I have a cousin who studied law. He had really good results, and he, he worked as a prosecutor in the Attorney General of Singapore. There was once I met him in Chinese New Year, so I was talking to him, I say, wow, oh, ever since you graduate, you know, you work as a prosecutor, I sense that you, you must be someone with a good sense of justice. <laughs> you know, I said that, you know. Uh, for many years, you know, he, he joined the AG and he never left. And he looked at me and smiled as if I said something stupid. <laughs> he said, no, what sense of justice? I mean, the money is good, man, <laughs> and it's secure. <laughs> so the best brain, in one of the best faculty in Singapore University, in one of the best government department, he doesn't understand what is the theology of law. You get what I mean? So what I'm saying here is I get very frightened when people just hope to, to ace their subject and go all the way to get a good job so that they can earn that money and live a comfortable life without asking what is the chief end of doing certain things or studying certain things. No, we are all victims of this. Now, this is the world system, I can tell you. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about, it's the same in every other country, okay? I'm talking about something spiritual, okay? And I especially reserve this be after the election so that we, uh, we can be very informed and all. And so, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, with most people that are studying now, we don't care about what is the values or theology within the education, I mean, I mean uh, where's Zina? Zina, are you here? Oh. oh, yeah. You know what's theology of your triple science? Oh, you're going to find out and tell me. 
Okay, now, I mean, you don't care about the values of the education system, and then you're also not trained to develop the keenness of learning and the curiosity. So at the end of it, you realize because of the lack of keenness to learn and curiosity, you will not have creativity, so you will not produce people like Bill Gates, like Steve Jobs, brilliant entrepreneurs, brilliant scientists, technocrats, and engineers who make brilliant products, and they can build great companies that employ tens of thousands. And that's why if you have these people up, the employment issues will be solved. If not, you've got to go back to the quest for productivity increase. You, you get what I'm trying to say? Now, I think our politicians, they know all these things. And if we are informed, if you have eyes to see, you will understand what is the point of contention now. And because money, economy, finance is God, and it do away with all the creativity and motivation for hard work. I have another cousin, okay? Now, I'm not making this up, okay? I have not a lot of cousins who gives me good lessons, okay? Another cousin, brilliant person. He did accountant, accountancy in NT. No, I think Hui did accountancy also. But for you to enter accountancy, now, think about this. Accountancy is a very niche faculty. You need triple A's, right? You triple A student, right? So he went and become a study accountant, but he never wanted to be an accountant. He wanted to get rich quickly. So he wanted to be an entrepreneur, and so he, he went to work in a restaurant, and then he worked on, as a housing agent, and then he worked as a, after that, he tries to work as an MLM, and he called himself an entrepreneur. So whatever he called himself, he didn't make it. Why? Because the values is not there. And the creativity is not there. The only thing that is there is material driven. And that is to get rich quickly. So economy and education. And education is mainly for economy, which means to say you are only studying to make money, not because you have an interest in learning, in pursuing knowledge, you're accumulating your CCA point, doing volunteer work, why? Because how many of you love to help the old folks and help the, I mean, the orphans in the orphanage you know, for the CCA points to get into polytechnic and university? Now, these are not my own words, okay? I've spoken to many, many teachers. But teachers, they are very passionate. They have, they told me, you know, we have read the education creed. It's well written. Really well, the values are there. But because the way the system is economy and capital driven, it's not possible. So what I'm saying is, if you know the Bible, you know these are not Christian values fundamentally. Christian beliefs and values bring you to the virtue of continual learning, the virtue of diligence and hard work, so that you gain specialization, like Joseph, like David. Joseph specialized in management. David specialized in a slingshot, throwing stones. You get what I mean? Now, these are the things they put in hard work, consistent hard work. So if you always deem the economy as the number one con consideration, the motivation behind every policy, whether it brings in investment, whether it creates wealth, you will lose the key to prosper as a nation. So after saying this, come back to the church responsibility. Singapore has a close to 20% Christian. So what is critical in the Christian message that is preached from the pulpit every week will determine how the next generation will be. As I've said again, if the pulpit is about God favoring me, increasing my wealth, uh, and so that my investments will grow, 
No, that is not going to get us anywhere. But if we get the worldview right, the values, the character, and the purpose of all things right from the Bible, then this nation will be strongly sustained by the prayers of the saints. It will mean that the church is influencing the country with its biblical values, and the country will stay strong, directed, steadfast. And this is what we see in the book of Esther, the character like Joseph, Daniel, what they have done, it only takes a small number of true blue Christians to bring about change and impact a secular nation. Now, I don't know whether this is a tall order for all of you. No, I'm talking about a lot of things. I wouldn't be talking about these in later weeks or any other weeks. This is a National Day week, okay? Understand? So, I mean, pray for your education, new education minister. I mean, students, right? I heard he's a Christian. No. Now, so economy and a bit on the education. And I hope all of you set yourself thinking through these issues and know why you have to be a true Christian. All right? And lastly, on the problem of fear. Now, I think this is a universal problem that comes with the fall of men. With the election that just passed, there is one word to describe this election. It is an election of fear. Now, in my opinion, now our government always fear that Singapore will not survive. So we keep focusing on the economy and drawing in investment. We practice regressive tax, increase reg regressive tax like GST, where everyone is taxed, instead of corporate tax. Why? Because if you tax corporate, they will run away, you know, so investment will go. Now, let me say, okay, let me say once and for all, set the record straight, we have a very, very good government. It provides good job, provides security, and it thinks ahead. But it's a paranoid government. It's always fearful. It's fearful that things will go wrong and we won't survive. We are thankful for this good governance, corruption-free. But we know it is a paranoid government and it operates by fear. And we know as Christians, nothing good comes out from fear. For the kingdom of God does not operate through fear. Now, what do you think? Can fear produce happiness or enjoyment? No, we can see clearly no. And most of us, if we fear, we know we are not enjoying, even we are rich. You know, we are comfortable, but we are not enjoying. You get what I mean? So, the more capable we are, the more we end up in a rat race, fear that we will lose out, and then gone is the career advancement and all. So, these are fear. You see, you ask yourself, what is there in our hearts? Yeah. Just past Sunday, I spoke to a parent. I said, you know, he was telling me about the stress of a parent in Singapore. I said, it's just stressful for a parent in Singapore. Sometimes, it's really the fear that your, your child will not meet the mark. Okay, I say, of course, as Christian parents, you know, we have a few marks to meet, you know, at least two. So he told me, <laughs> first, I want my child to be God-fearing. Praise God. I want him to love the Lord. Second, I also want him to do well academically, okay? So increasingly hard for that to happen, you know. You've got to attend church, be faithful in serving and all. You've got to do well in results in school. And I say, yeah, I think the Bible promised us both in a way. But the thing is, if you try to push your child to meet those marks, because of your fear and insecurity, it's not going to work. Your child is not going to be happy. You get what I mean? Because there's always an in, intense stress there to do well, to strive harder. Why? For fear of something that I don't get. You get what I mean? Now, you're all of you going to feel this when uh, young parents grow up, you know. And some of you already start worrying for your child when they are 
in kindergarten, I don't know for what, you know, let them enjoy. And, but the thing is, now, fear always hinders everything that is good. And with fear, you study, you will only end up with good grades, but you will not study to learn. You get what I mean? You see, fear. So, I've shared this experience with some of us. If there is only one thing I've learned well in my uni life, and that is the last year, I learned that it's no longer about grades as I study. During my last year, I got it right. And I said, I'm going to study for the kingdom and study to learn. To learn, just to learn, because God created knowledge. And it's right for, for a Christian to study to learn. And that is when, during that last year, I finally appreciate what I'm really studying. I'm really learning stuff that I really appreciate. And I, I got the, my best grades you know, during my last year. Sort of too late, but it's all right. <laughs> you know. But the best grades that I got. So I began to understand, yeah, fear really opened up the way for the enemy to have you do his bidding. You get what I mean? Fear will, will tell you, you know, make all the calculations, think 10 steps ahead, make sure everything is right, but somehow, somewhere, things will go wrong. Do you realize that? So now, what I'm trying to say is, I don't have to say now, you know, this year is a year of fear, you know. With the COVID-19, more fear now, everyone fear. Fear of losing their jobs, fear of getting infected, even though the community has less than five cases, I mean, these few days, there's one cases, two cases, and the fear went into the church, and believers fear together, church leaders apprehensive about opening up the church. And I've heard Christians even discourage their family members from attending church. Now, let me say, there is a difference between careful, being careful and fearful. Being careful, we should be, is doing enough while living what is unpredictable to God. So you come to church, you wear your mask, you wash your hands, and you worship by faith, believing that God will protect everyone. So you enjoy your worship. By being fearful, always overkill. It's really not reading the facts rightly, sacrificing what is essential, there's simply no consideration for the providence of God, that God is in charge of all, but merely consumed by what if the worst happened? What if, what if this happened, that happened? Now you ask yourself, with that kind of mentality, would you rise to the worst stage, like David, like Joseph, like Daniel? The message that I always give the remnant of this era. So, you saw, when the Israelites can no longer see Moses, they are fearful, insecure. And they press Aaron, come make us that image. Give us that security. Give us what we want. And Aaron fear. Okay, okay, just give me what you have and I'll make you what you want. Now, Aaron can represent church leaders. Aaron can also represent political Christian leaders. You get what I mean? So the last thing we want is we have a lot of errands in, in this country. I'm preaching this message not to speak negatively against our government. None of that idea. I'm giving this message for us to be discerning, to be informed, to know how you should pray and submit to your Christian political leaders. Especially, I'm saying Christian political leaders because only they have the Bible. They know the truth. But because of the pressure that is relentless from the world, from the Liberal Party, from, from the younger generation, you see, if we don't get certain facts right, we don't get the truth or the principle right, we don't know how to pray for them. We will look at our, our young, younger friends and say, oh, you, you became liberal, oh, you accept abortion, oh, you accept LGBT, oh, that's love, and let's all accept, you know. Now, I don't want Christians to be so misinformed in that sense. If we are really going to pray for the Christian political leaders, now you understand their dilemma, 
the stress and pressure they are under. You know, this is a circular government, they are sandwiched. Now they have to answer to the electorate, and they have the Bible here, and they have the Liberal Party, Liberal came there. And how are they going to do it? I don't know. But with your prayers, they will be able to prevail. You get what I mean? So, um, uh, so God, I pray God sustain uh, our national leaders. Okay, in that sense. So if we get this message right, we can see issues clearly. We know the, the problem of diversity. It's not so simple. Economy, can anyone say I'm happy without a job? No one can say that. But do we want to be drive and to, to work just for money, to study just for a good job, so that at the end of it you ask yourself, God asks you what do you want, so that I can have a, a comfortable life, and how are you going to see the Lord? <laughs> you know, if that is your mentality, am I right? And then for fear, of course, the COVID-19 is the best test for us. This year, we have went through trials and trials, and to a point, we know what is the essential. And that is for the saints together, to pray together, to worship in faith, and to believe God will answer our prayer. All right? Come, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the message today. And, and you have instructed us to, to pray for those in position, those in the authorities. So, Lord, we submit to what you have instructed us. We thank you for this government. Uh, we know the dilemma that is involved. And we have went through like a watershed election and all. But Lord, even with that, we know very well from the truth that you have given us what should be our stand. And Lord, a lot of things... Um, it's not by mere words, but it's unless our Lord himself built the house. If not, the house will not be built. Unless you raise up for yourself the strong Christian political leaders, if not, we will have bent to the will of the world. So Lord, I pray with this message, educate our young people our younger generation, and all those, also all of us who heard this message, that um, we will be discerning to know what is best and what is good. And so that as honorable citizens in this country and also God-fearing Christian, we know how to do right and pray right and, uh, for this country. So, Lord, I pray uh, for this COVID situation. I pray that um, things will become clearer. I pray that Christians will become bold and stronger and courageous in you and to believe that our prayer and our gathering will influence the country positively. So, Lord, I thank you. Give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.